every year, committees in Sweden and Norway award six Nobel Prizes, each recognizing a groundbreaking contribution by an individual or organization in a specific field. Prizes are given for physiology or medicine, physics, chemistry, economic science, literature, and peace work. In 2021, the Nobel Prize for Literature was awarded to Tanzanian novelist Abdurraza Ghana for his uncompromising and, com and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism and the fate of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. The Zanzibar-born writer, who is based in the UK, is best known for his novels, Paradise, The Session, and By the Sea. Joining us on this show this morning, right now, as we discuss and celebrate his works, his impact in literature, and also his participation in the AK Arts and Books Festival, is Professor Abdurazak Ghana, award-winning Tanzanian-born British novelist and winner of the 2021 Nobel Prize for Literature. Welcome to The Morning Show, Professor Ghana. Good to have you on The Morning Show. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I guess... Uh, you know, you coming for the uh, Ake Books and Arts Festival is some kind of uh, homecoming uh, for you. Having been a lecturer at the Bayero uh, University, Kano, 1980-1983, and uh, your Nigerian connections. But your novels, 10 of them now. That's correct, yes, I was there. Yeah, 10 of them now talk about home, yep. displacement, exile, right? And the crisis, you know, that uh, people right. who are displaced uh, go through. Now, what does home mean to you? I mean, you have Tanzanian connections. You live in, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, your wife is from the uh, Caribbean. Uh, your writing tries to do that connection between old and new worlds. So what do those things, home, exile, displacement, suffering, what do they really mean to you? Well, home is not a simple thing, you know, because uh, it could be where you are ancestrally from. M many of us, millions of us, uh, do not actually live in those places anymore. That we move, it could be in the same country, it could be moving from the country to the city, it could be different countries. But there are different ideas of home, is what I'm trying to say. That still remains home, the place where your ancestors come from and where you were born and grew up. But then you also, uh, where you live and where you work and where you make a new family, that is also home. So many of us have more than one. Uh, so homecoming here, for the, which is the theme of the Ake Festival, is uh, both uh, an idea of people returning to something that they love, which is literature or writing or exchanging ideas, but also because almost all the people who are invited are originally African, from Africa. Some of them still live in Africa. Some of them live elsewhere. So home remains home, even if you make another home. <laughs> Hi, fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, as, uh, just going back to the second part of uh, Dr. Abati's question with regards to your writing and the, the content of your writing, your writing style, and the basis on which you won the Nobel Peace Prize. Can you tell us the influence of uh, the transition of the young boy growing up in Tanzania to the older man, you know, living, having, you know, forced migration to the United Kingdom and the impact it's had on your book since your first novel? Yeah, uh, well, actually, it was the Literature Prize. You, just, you said Peace Prize. My apologies, <laughs> but it doesn't Literature. Matter. Anyway, it was the prize. No, 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 no problem, no problem. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's something that uh, we're very familiar with now. There are millions of people now who have gone through that experience of leaving either voluntarily or not entirely voluntarily, in some cases because uh, their lives were at risk um, and continue to be at risk. So there are various reasons why people find themselves displaced or find themselves forced to leave and go and live somewhere else. Um, and it was something a little bit like that, although not as the extent as we know from the um, WHO, from the United Nations, that the numbers of refugees and displaced people at the moment are probably higher than they have ever been in history, in human history, that is. For me, it was not quite that um, awful as it is now for so many people who are losing their homes. But it was still difficult. I mean, being a stranger in 
in another country, especially if you are young and you are on your own without your family, is quite difficult. It's hard. You have to learn. You have to learn very quickly, and you have to be poor for quite a while um, while you are learning, and you have to acquire skills and knowledge and so on. Many of us, as we leave our homes, do not have any skills. We just have uh, an eagerness and, uh, I suppose, a youthful sort of energy, which, which is maybe the, uh, the greatest strength of uh, some of these young people who are taking the risks to go to different countries. It's that that will enable them to, to progress, to, to make something, to, to be resourceful, to do whatever it might be that they are um, fated or gifted or wish to do. So I was writing about that not only as a personal experience, but because I see that this is one of the, one of the f f uh, phenomena as well of, of the times we live in, this, this uh, great movement of people, particularly people from formerly colonized uh, territories and nations into, uh, into the north, into Europe, into the United States, etc. Um, so it's not a, you don't have to think too hard to think this is a, an important subject to write about. You also write about a very, very topical issue of colonialism, which many years after it has happened now on the African continent, we can't get our minds off it. That level of neglect and pain, I mean, like you wrote about an afterlife and the characters and the afterlife felt from the Germans, you know, and others that colonized the African continent. I mean, you still carry that neglect with you. You still feel that identity crisis everywhere you go. I mean, can you articulate in words the pain, the neglect, the shutting the door in your face that colonialism brings and the subjugation it brings? Well, there are many different levels, of course. There is the, the, uh, this, the, the story that had been told about the relationship, if you like, of the colonizer and colonized. Which, which necessarily has to be one of diminishing the other uh, in order to justify um, colonization. There is that, so there is a psychological dimension, if you like. But there is also the, uh, the other side of things, which is the consequences of, uh, of um, all the kind of coercive measures that were necessary to extract whatever wealth there was in many different countries and take it back to Europe. Uh, the consequences of that are still with us. The consequences of uh, sort of civilizational uh, and ideological plans and moves to introduce forms of uh, culture or education, etc. All of these are also still with us. So in a way, in a way, we we most places that were colonized, particularly in Africa, many places that were colonized are still kind of struggling to get out from under the weight of all of that. Uh, that constitutes the experience of colonialism. So on the one hand, there is what you're calling the hurt of neglect and so on, which is something we have to sort out because we have to understand ourselves better and understand what we are worth better. But there are other kind of more, um, shall we say, more, more systemic uh, consequences that it's not quite so easy to, to get out of, particularly, particularly if the resources available are not quite as... Uh, as extensive as say, a country like Nigeria, which has a very large population and has many natural uh, resources, not many countries have those advantages. And for them, it's even harder, I think, to escape the, those sorts of consequences that I've described. Well, what takes me to the next question? In The Empire Writes Back, the book by Bill Ashcroft, Trifling and uh, Griffiths, they talk about post-colonial uh, uh, literatures and the impact and all of that. And you know, many literary uh, persons say, oh, the empire has written back. And yet, in spite of the achievements, uh, post-colonial uh, contests from the South, people like you still get described as di uh, writers in diaspora, uh, writers in exile, despite the fact that you know, um, your writing is basically situated in East Africa, in uh, Zanzibar, you know, trying to relate the old world to the new world and all that. How do you react to those labels, which seem, you know, to limit the impact of the empire on mainstream literature? You can't resist labels. You can't resist what people call you. Uh, 
you just kind of have to be clear what it is that you are doing. Um, and um, if, if you could, could be wasting time and your life and your energy uh, fighting back for people calling you this and calling you that, I don't worry about that. I just worry about making sure that uh, what uh, I think is necessary to do is done. And I think many people who, who, who read with, a, with an open mind and intelligence are not too bothered about a description like that. I think it's the content of what is there in the writing that is, uh, that, that is what engages them. Your book, By the Sea, is about an aging asylum seeker trying to build a life in Britain by Britain's coastal city. Now, I've had an opportunity to work with asylum seekers and refugees, the UK being a host country, with displacement centers in different parts of the UK. And just being able to see firsthand the impact of migration and being refugees in another country for a number of African, or you know, like yourself, do you think that your work though fiction, would give the voice to asylum seekers and refugees who, for many of them, want to be heard, want to be listened to, want to be seen? And to what extent do you think that impact would be? Well, I very much hope so. That's not the primary purpose for writing. Uh, I mean, you know, the primary purpose for writing is, for me anyway, is not necessarily to bring about social transformation. I'm not saying it's something I don't want to happen, but I'm saying that is not the primary purpose. For me, I write because this is what I see, this is what I understand, and this is what I feel is necessary to do. And if it has that kind of effect, that is to say it opens the minds of those who didn't know uh, about these experiences, that's one thing. If it helps those who have themselves gone through experiences like this to say, yes, it, that's how it feels for me too, that is also important. Because I think that's what literature is, it's, or this is what writing is. It, it, it has many different uh, results. It gives us pleasure, because we enjoy, like we listen to music, we enjoy. It also brings us news about things we didn't know, and at times it makes us think, oh yes, I know, that's exactly how it feels for me too. So all of these will be part of what uh, I think, what a writer would be hoping for. In this particular case, it's such an important issue, it seems to me that people, uh, both those who have gone through the experience and those who don't know anything about this experience, would, I think, find it uh, beneficial to know more or to feel that there are other people like them that they can share this, they can identify this feeling with. So based on this conversation of neglect and colonialism and how the conversation you know, spun on into many things, in fact, some people have thought about taking you know, more definitive stance, even as regards the language of use of writing. You know, one prominent person you would know is when Ngugi Wationgo took a stand, you know, and says, you know, I'll probably write more in my local languages, you know, to be able to espouse my identity. Uh, because a lot of people feel the neglect, and it was segue into the conversation on reparations. What do you think about that conversation? as a writer that has written about these experiences and the exploitation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, that's a complicated question. You begin with language and you end with reparations. But that's OK. I think the idea of language is that I think for a writer, you choose your language and you write any way you can, any way you, you feel strongest and best. I admire people like Ngugi, I admire people uh, who don't necessarily write in an African language. So far as that's concerned, I'm kind of um, tolerant, as it were, <laughs> about what language people use, so long as we get to speak to each other and understand each other. On the question of reparations, it's, it's a growing conversation. It's an important conversation. Um, so much uh, has been plundered from different places, some of it very deliberately so, uh, you know all about it here in Nigeria because of the conversation that's going on about the Benin bronzes, which was a result of literally of plunder after uh, a military operation. Uh, there are many other similar cases in different parts of the world, in different parts of Africa, in India, etc. There's also another kind of plunder, which we saw in Iraq after the invasion, uh, the US and their allies' invasion, which is opportunistic which is people just stealing things and selling them on. All of these things are being identified and 
many, many places are now becoming aware, that is to say many places that apparently own these things, museums, etc., are beginning to understand that either they're going to have to return these things or work out some arrangement that makes sure that people are recompensed, those nations for whom these, from whom these things have been stolen are recompensed. So that's one kind of reparation. There's another kind of reparation for which there cannot be a payment. I'm thinking here of massacres, I'm thinking of depopulation, of things that cannot be put back, lives that were lost. Uh, and this is true of, um, again, several places in the world. It's true of the Atlantic slavery, it's true of the massacres of the Herero in Namibia, etc. You cannot put these things back, you cannot return things, but you can make amends in some way. And, and most of all, you can take responsibility. So there is also a symbolism involved in reparation, to say, yes, we did this and we were wrong to do it. That too is important. But it's a complicated issue, because some of it is centuries ago. And people might say, well, it's nothing to do with me. But nevertheless, there are national responsibilities, as they were. And there are benefits that have accrued to people as a result of these acts. That too has to be recognized. So I think it's important, and I see it developing. I think it's a conversation that will grow. It's an important one. Okay, Professor Ghana, I'm, I'm tempted to take you back to the question of language in African literature from Ben Obunselu's original essay, 1963, um, and all that argument about Pan-Africanism in literature, and uh, also uh, Gugiwa Thiongu and all of that, and your own use of Swahili. Um, in uh, some of your works and your objection to making the alien seem more alien, not italicizing. But let's leave uh, uh, literature, um, you know, that part of it. Let me ask you two basic questions. The first one is, what role are you playing at the Arcade Festival? And the second one is the refugee crisis, which is a major issue uh, in your writing. Today, uh, Suela Beverman, uh, the uh, Home Secretary, he said, oh, they will restrict uh, the number of foreign students that come. They will deal with channel crossings, uh, you know, to check uh, net migration, which we're told is about 504,000. So is the refugee crisis today of a different color than it was, say, in 1967? Yeah, sure, sure. It's a completely different situation. Well, not completely, but it's a very different situation. The first question, what am I doing at the AK Festival? Well, last year, the, uh, I was invited to the festival, but as you know, because of COVID, the festival could, could not be held, um, and it was done virtually. That They made a film uh, in which I spoke with um, Maza Mengiste, the Ethiopian writer, uh, and I believe that was shown at the festival. So when it was possible to have the festival again in person this year, they invited me to come, and I was delighted to be able to come, especially since in between the, the, those two events, uh, the Swedish Academy awarded the Nobel Prize to me. So it, it was a kind of, it was a pleasure to, 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 to be able to attend the festival in person. It was also a pleasure to return to Nigeria after so many years, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, I, I did work here for, for two years at uh, by Aero University in Kano, but I hadn't been back in all of that time. So more like, what is it now, 40 years or so? So it was a pleasure to, to come visiting again and to be able to participate in this very important um, literary festival, this book festival. Um, yeah, I think that's the question you asked, wasn't it? And what, oh yeah, Swala Braverman. I don't know, the Conservative Party in particular are absolutely obsessed with this idea of numbers. So their language, it constantly and increasingly so kind of criminalizes activities uh, which, are, which are not at all criminal. I mean, after all, your, your, your example says that she's going to restrict the number of foreign students coming into the UK. They're not refugees. They're people who will be paying their way. They come because, um, to be quite honest, and I know this from experience, British universities depend on uh, foreign students. Many British universities, many British university programs would not run if there weren't uh, foreign students uh, attending and uh, registering for those courses. 
So this is just waffle. This is just talk to appease the people. In the meantime, the real refugees, because they use such language, the real refugees are being detained, they're being denied their human rights, they're being treated like criminals for years in some cases. Uh, they're not allowed to work, they're not allowed to travel, etc. All of these, these absolutely uh, cruel um, measures to try and uh, somehow appease uh, a part of the political body in, in the United Kingdom. It's, it's, it's intolerable, it's inhuman. Why, thank you very much. Just going back to the Ake, Ake Festival, which you're going to be participating in, like you mentioned last year, you couldn't be here, unfortunately, due to COVID, and we're excited to see that you're able to make it physically in Nigeria. And like Dr. Abati mentioned, it's a sort of homecoming for you. Could, could you detail some of the sessions you'll be taking, uh, take us through if you would be uh, meeting with a few of our young, young uh, writers like you in Nigeria, and what should we should look forward to with your presence at the Ake Festival this year? Yeah, well, you look forward to my presence because I'm here. <laughs> but what I've seen so far, we've only had one day. <clears throat> so yesterday we had a full day from, you know, uh, from the opening ceremony all the way through till um, uh, nine o'clock or something like that. And I saw and heard many things, both from uh, young writers and poets, but also uh, from more established uh, people, from publishers as well. Uh, we saw some uh, outtakes of the film of um, uh, Death in the King's Horseman, uh, which unfortunately the director, B. Mandele, uh, passed away uh, during the filming, I believe. Uh, I knew him many years ago. Um, and so we saw, we saw a full range. We saw uh, young people, we saw established people, we saw people who were working as you were, not in the spotlight, but doing the real work uh, of distributing and publishing and so on. And we also saw this film. Amongst the guests, I know there's, uh, the, this year's headliner is Veronique Tajo, for example, from the Ivory Coast, and who's been, uh, who's a, um, an established writer from, uh, in African writing. Um, and many, many new, and now, you know, people are appearing for the first time at events like this. It's a very exciting thing. Excellent. All right. Uh, I'd like to say thank you so much for your time, but just to ask this as we start to wrap things up, the question is, what is the future? Generations will come and go, but what is the future like, and how are we preparing for the future? You know, as regards conversations on our race, our identity, our heritage, mass migration and all of that, what would be the future? I mean, you were responding to Dr. Bass's question, and you said, you know, immigration and all of that was different as at the time you got into the UK than it is now today. So what would be the future of all this conversation as, as you look forward? Well, I mean, I wish I could be a prophet and say the future will be this or that. I can't do that. Uh, all I can say is that we have to continue doing what we're doing, uh, both in pointing out uh, injustice when we see it, in, in protesting uh, against that, in continuing to offer hospitality where it's possible. Uh, I mean hospitality in a, in a large sense. I don't mean <laughs> just uh, providing a drink or a meal, but that as well. But to think of each other in a hospitable way uh, and to move on from some of these um, uh, oppressive and narrow-minded intolerances that uh, seem to be, um, I think, uh, driving the panic in, in Europe, say, and in, and in North America, because the, there is another dimension of this which we haven't discussed, which, was, which is the, the dispossession and the impoverishment of uh, native people in, in the American continent, who in the end have no choice but to go to where there is prosperity and then to be treated as if they too are criminals trying to um, somehow come and steal from the rich countries in North America or in Europe. I think we have to move on from that. And so what I would want to see in the future is a greater tolerance and a greater awareness of what it is that we do to each other when we speak these uh, criminalizing narratives. Okay, uh, Professor Ghana, just before we go, somebody watching this program says, uh, Professor Gunnar looks like Shuyinka, Wale Shuyinka, that is. 
minus the beard and the paucity of hairs, uh, you know, and you are in a showing cancer country. Are you going to meet with him before you leave? But I also want you to talk about your influences. You've written as a scholar, beyond uh, being a, a storyteller, on V.S. Naipaul, on uh, Salman Rushdie. You even did, uh, you edited uh, a companion uh, to Salman Rushdie. You know, the place of the writer in today's world, in terms of relationship with states and audiences. If you could comment briefly on that before we go. Yeah, well, uh, many, you know, I've been reading and writing. My profession has been both a writer and an academic, and almost all of it in, uh, in African literature. I did my PhD in African writing. So, of course, I know uh, the work of Olishenka and many other Nigerian writers and African writers. And talking of influences, I mean, you know, you read all your life. So I don't know where you can pinpoint the influence. They're all, they're all wonderful uh, and important writers, men, women, um, and over the years, living and dead. And over the years, you read, and that's what writers do. They read, 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 read all the time. And I find it really hard to answer this question of uh, what is the influence. They all, at various times, you know, play a part in uh, broadening um, your understanding or just simply uh, exciting your admiration and thinking, how can something like that be done? Um, so the examples, it doesn't mean that you go and write like that because everybody has to find their own way of writing. Uh, but you do see and admire uh, something achieved, especially if it's something difficult, and you think, how did she do that? And that's the pleasure of being influenced, if you want. But that influence doesn't necessarily mean that you will then go and attempt precisely that thing yourself. Well, thank you very much, Professor Ghana, for joining us on The Morning Show. Great pleasure having you on the show.